Hi, everybody. Welcome to the eighth annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Jamie Machek with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service, and I am uh, moderating the opening session today as well as the technology track. So if you're in any of those sessions, you will hear me again. And assisting me today is Jean Anderson with the South Central Library System. We're so glad to have all of you here all of you from Wisconsin and from other parts of the country. Our presenter for the opening session is Doug Crane, and Doug is the director of the Palm Beach County Library System in Florida. And Doug's going to be talking about work culture and things that shape our organization when it comes to work culture. So Doug, whenever you're ready, please begin. Okay, well, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I hope you're all having a lovely morning already. Uh, I'm, we're of course, talking to you from West Palm Beach, Florida, down in Southeast Florida. And it turns out we just had our strongest cold snap of the year. It's currently only 46 degrees out there, which is about 25 degrees below our normal uh, seasonal average for this time of year. And it's sort of funny when you think of Florida is, uh, and it's one thing I discovered living down here is that when the temperature in Florida drops below 60 degrees, an unusual thing happens. Uh, you can easily tell the locals from the tourists at that point. That's because the local residents all go into their closets and pull out all sort of assorted winter wear and they look like this. Whereas the tourists who have paid all this money to come down here are all having fun at the beach and swimming in the ocean. So uh, it's sort of rather amusing to see, but it's uh, something if you decide to come down here to Florida one day in the winter, then you might see it for yourself and be one of those tourists at the beach swimming happily away while the locals are all bundled up in weird assorted winter clothes that they pull out once or twice a year. Anyway, uh, with that little brief aside, I want to start with a question for everyone in the audience. And what you can do is type in your answer in, into the panel on the side there. And the question is this, why did you apply to work for your library or your organization that you're currently at? You know, what prompted you when you saw that advertisement out there to go to all the trouble to fill out a job application to try and be employed at that location? So please take a moment just to fill out some, uh, fill out your quick response. Why did you apply to work for where you're working right now? All right, so I'm seeing some responses come in already. Um, I love books and reading. Um, well, another response is hometown. I knew that my chances of employment were high. I love books. Uh, Lisa says I needed a job, <laughs> um, a new challenge. Um, position was a new challenge. Working with kids, it was close to home. Um, I want to be closer to family, and I've never worked in a bad library, uh, which is great. Um, was invited by a previous director to apply, was familiar with the community. Um, good opportunity. So I think we're seeing uh, some, some common themes here. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for participating in that. Um, and certainly when we go to apply to work somewhere, we often have very high hopes, as the song goes, about what we may experience. So I'm sure many of you have been in your position or for you, with your organization uh, for a little while now. Some of you might be years with your organization. So I have a follow-up question. Now that you've actually worked there, why are you still there? What gets you excited to still continue working at that at the organization you're at, as opposed to hitting the job market and finding somewhere else to work? So again, type in your responses on the side. What keeps you working where you currently are? And, and I'd suggest you say more than just the paycheck, because there are other jobs out there <laughs> that could give you the same paycheck, or potentially even more if you job hunt. Okay, so I'm seeing I enjoy helping the public. I love the people, passionate staff. I love my job. Uh, great pay, and I feel like I'm making a difference in the community. Um, amazing coworkers. I love my job. The variety, the flexibility, <clears throat> um, the people, um, helping people, helping our community. Um, good people. Love the mission of public libraries. Uh, the organization encourages us to be innovative and keeps things interesting. Uh, Nicole says public service, helping people. So again, I think we're seeing a lot of common themes with this uh, question as well. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you again for responding. Because, uh, you know, certainly when we work, there's a lot of different types of workplaces you could be at. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this type of workplace, uh, where you can see everyone's kind of on edge, people are yelling and screaming at each other, people are trying to avoid issues, people are just kind of looking at their computers, hoping problems go away. And that's definitely not an environment that I think many of you would sign up to join, even if they paid you lots of money to do it. I'm sure many of you would rather have this type of culture, where you have people working together, people happy, people responding to each other, working together for a common cause, uh, and probably as depicted in this photo, but diversity in your workplace. So the question is, how do we go from a workplace that's not very welcoming, and in fact, probably hostile, to one that's collaborative? Well, it has to do with culture. Now, the word culture itself is a big word. If you look in the dictionary, you'll find multiple definitions for culture. And some of them would refer to such things as, you know, culture of a country, for example. It's landmarks, it's food, it's language. Those are often thought of as a culture. Uh, we sometimes think of culture in terms of the spiritual, moral, and ethical values that a society or a group of people share and have together. Another thought about culture can be the music, the arts, what is it that people come together to enjoy and to experience? And of course, another thought about culture is things like artwork, painting, uh, the movies, the TV shows, the radio programs that everyone in that particular culture is listening at, listening to and watching. Now, those definitions of culture are, are certainly very acceptable ones. But when we think of a workplace, and we get, actually get down to what is a culture, well, culture is really what everyone brings to the table. And culture is composed of different people from different backgrounds. And when you think about a work environment, you're bringing in people who have come to a job, to an organization, yet they're all bringing different backgrounds, different beliefs. They may come from different parts of the country. And certainly where I live in Florida, we have a lot of people who have moved to the state from another part of the country or even from outside the country. And so it really makes a diverse set of backgrounds. So when you have a set of, it might be easier when you're in say a small town where everyone has grown up, when they all come together to work at a, at a company or business in that small town, there's probably already a set culture ready to go. But when you get to larger municipalities or larger systems, or even nowadays just everywhere in the country, people seem to be more mobile, you're gonna run into people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different beliefs, and a lot of different work experiences. So one of the challenges for our organizations is how do we create a culture where everyone can feel at home and everyone can feel that they are a member of it and get opportunities to grow and develop? So some of that starts with the organization, and every good organization should have a vision. For example, here's our vision for the library system in Palm Beach County. It's opening minds to a world of unlimited possibilities. And that vision for the organization should in turn drive its mission. And in this case, our mission is to connect communities, inspire thought, and enrich lives. And if your organization is good and is on the ball, they've probably taken their mission like we have and broken it down into their strategic plan. And that strategic plan really covers what the organization intends to do with the resources, time, and staffing levels that it has available to make an impact to the community and to the public that it serves. Now, a lot of organizations have a strategic plan. In fact, I'm sure if you're working for a public library, wherever you are, you no doubt need to have one for your municipality or for your county or for your state library in order to get state aid as we do here in Florida, we have to provide a copy of our strategic plan. Yet strategy is not everything. And it's not even really the key to a successful culture. Uh, I'll mention here before I reveal what the key is, as we go along, if you have any questions regarding any of the content that I'm being presenting, please feel free to type it into the question box and the moderators will review that and at appropriate times interrupt me with the questions. But at this point, I want to share with you the key, the key to a successful culture. And I think this is very important, so pay very close attention. The key is this, bionicles. 
Is everyone familiar with Bionicles? I don't know if you are. They're basically these little Lego robots that you can go and build. Now, you might be wondering, what the heck does Bionicles have to do with an organization's culture? Well, let me share where this comes from. There's a behavioral economist, his name is Dan Ariely. You can see his picture here on the screen. And like behavioral economists, what they like to do is look at how people respond to incentives. Why do, they, why do people do what they do? And they often set up these unusual and quite thought-provoking experiments, and they find unwitting test subjects to run them through to see how people respond to different situations. So Mr. Ariely and his colleagues did a research project featuring bionicles, these little Lego robots. Now, the first condition they set up, because every experiment they have to run with at least two different conditions. The first condition they set up they had people come up and they offered them an opportunity to build one of these bionicles. And to incentivize it, they said they would pay the person $3 to build the first bionicle. It's great. So if a person built the first bionicle, the instructor would take it, put it on the table and say, all right, great. Would you like to build another one? This time for $2.70, obviously a little less. If the person did it, and they came back, they put that bionicle on the table next to the first one and say, okay, would you like to build another one for 240? So I think by now you've got the catch. Each extra bionicle they built, they would be 30 cents less. Eventually, I guess, reaching a point where someone would have to start paying the uh, facilitators to build a bionicle. And during this time, each bionicle was just placed aside and people could see their work. So under these conditions, how many bionicles do you think the average test subject built? And you can write your answers in the questions and you can, in, the, in the question box. So if I could get, as people type in, uh, their guess as to how many bionicles the average subject would build. And building a bionicle wasn't that hard and it was actually kind of fun just in itself. So do we have any guesses out there yet? So I'm seeing uh, three, six, five, one, 20, four, two, 12, three. <laughs> five, a lot of fives, a lot of, a lot of fives. Yeah, uh, I guess I guess many of you don't like building bionicles, but <laughs> the the answer was eleven. The average test subject got built eleven bionicles, and of course they got paid for it. So uh, the pay itself was one of the incentives. Now, as I said, they are behavioral economists, so they have to come up with a second condition for their test. So they got a different group of people, and they ran the same test where. Basically, it was three dollars for the first bionicle, two seventy for the next, two fifty for the third, two forty for the third, et cetera, going forward. But the twist this time was this: after the person turned in the first bionicle, the researcher gave them a second bionicle, and while they were doing that, they tore apart the first bionicle right at the table in front of the participant. And when the participant came back with the second bionicle, the researcher would offer them a chance to rebuild the first one and they tear apart the second one while the person was rebuilding the first one. So under those conditions, remember, same amount of money for the number of bionicles they did. How many, um, let, me ask, let me ask the question a little differently. Do you think test subjects built more bionicles? Or do you think they built the same number of bionicles? Or do you think they built less, fewer bionicles? So just say more, the same, or less. And remember, it was 11 they built the first time. Um, I'm seeing a lot of less or fewer. Uh, one same, one more. Mostly, mostly, yeah, mostly less as a response. Mostly less. Okay, for those that did it, that was correct. They only built seven bionicles in this condition. Now, that was a, for the researchers, it was a um, statistically significant result. Now, why would that be? They got paid the same amount. I mean, after all, if people only cared about pay then what happened to the Bionicle once they were done should be irrelevant to them, right? So maybe a few of you can type in quickly, why do you think they built less? Especially those who, who already tapped into the idea they were gonna build less. Why would you think they would build less? Just type them into the question box. So I'm seeing their work wasn't valued, frustration, mm -hmm. work was less appreciated, Another work was unappreciated, they felt defeated, effort not recognized, pointlessness, wasted mm -hmm. time, efforts not valued, stressful environment. Why do something that's going to be ruined? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I think what this 
project shows is that, um, clearly shows is that people are driven by more than just the financial incentives. And sometimes certainly employers may feel that people are driven by incentives by money and other benefits. But clearly for people to do high quality work, they need to feel more than just uh, the satisfaction of a big paycheck. They want something else. So let's look at what that something else might be. Now, in most organizations, you have people paying attention to the tactical side of the organization. And that's really what a strategic plan covers. It's what are you gonna do with the resources you have? What are you gonna do with the people that you do? What times are you gonna, what are your tasks are you gonna give everyone? And how do you know you're successful in what you're planning? And that's extremely important. Every organization needs to have their tactical side down. But when you talk about tactics, there's a quote from a famous German military historian, a strategist, who said that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. What he means is that you can have this great strategy, but once you actually get out there and the public or your customers interact with it, well, you're gonna find that what you thought was gonna happen may change. And if you're gonna be successful, you have to be able to change with the environment as it goes along and with your customers or your members or your public's need. That means every organization also has to be adaptive. They need to go with the flow. They need to be able to adjust their plans on the fly. Even if they have their goals and strategies set, they may need to change their tactics, their approach to things to get it done. In fact, another famous uh, general, Charles de Gaulle, once said, you have to be faster on your feet and adaptive or else a strategy is useless. So the question is, what drives people to be adaptive? Because it takes energy and commitment to be adaptive. And the answer in one word is this motivation. If people are not motivated to change, to learn, to try new things, then they're just going to continue doing the same old stuff over and over again and not care about the result. And ultimately for an organization to succeed, they need to have their employees, their supervisors, their managers, their owners, etc., be motivated, be willing, be excited to work. And what drives motivation? is the, the culture of the organization. And if you don't have a strong culture, then motivation will fail. In fact, a, one of the most famous organizational theorists, Peter Drucker, once is famous for saying, culture eats strategy for lunch. And it's, it's an often quoted line, especially in business circles. And, but what, you, what Peter Drucker was getting at is, look, you can have the best strategy in the world, but if your culture sucks, no one's gonna care about the strategy. It'll just be stay on that paper and people will do the bare minimum possible to get their paycheck. So now I mentioned culture is this big all encompassing word, but how do we break it down into something a little more manageable? Because if you're gonna improve culture, you have to think what are the components that drive a culture? Uh, there's an organization called Focus Three, they're a consulting group. And I like using their definition of culture. They define culture as this. It's a set of common beliefs that lead to a set of accepted behaviors that are intended to create an experience for both the people inside the organization and for those outside the organization that they serve. So we'll break these down very quickly here. Beliefs are basically your core values. It's what the people in your organization believe. Now it can be also their personal beliefs, but an organization can also set up organizational beliefs. Uh, so for example, here are some of the values that we had in my library system, making a difference, empowering communities, learning and growing. And I'm gonna share how we've actually grown and developed on these in a few moments. But if you don't have everyone agree on what they're believing, then people are going to decide to do different behaviors. And you know, there's a classic thing that's referenced by this little video, this shot of these ducks, the angel and the devil, right? Because every time someone in your organization has to make a decision that's not cut and dry, they have a choice to either make a decision that's gonna be supportive of the organization, be helpful to the customers, and otherwise do good. Or they can make a decision that's purely in their selfish interests, that just helps make their work life easier at the expense of the organization and the customers. Because the behaviors that should be guided by your beliefs should help you determine what's right and wrong. Now, that may sometimes be very clear, 
But as you've probably discovered in your work life, some decisions are very foggy or fuzzy. We're not very clear what's right or wrong. So going back to your beliefs can at least help give guidance. You might not always make the right decision, but if you go by your beliefs, at least you've had a, a groundwork from where to go from. Now these behaviors should in turn create an experience. You know, what, do you, what are people going to get out of this? you know, from these behaviors. Now, sometimes we think of experience, and I, I like to travel. So if you think of when you travel to another country, you know, you get a different experience of life by going to that country. Now, if you're only going, crossing the border into Canada, you'll certainly experience a different culture, but you're gonna see a lot that's similar since the language, a lot of the core beliefs, et cetera, are very similar. But if you were to travel around the country to say China, to walk on the Great Wall that you see here, the Chinese culture is very different. Not only a different set of language, you know, languages, uh, um, signage, you know, the way the people interact, the food you're gonna experience, the smells you're gonna see, the sights, et cetera. It's a whole different experience. Now there's another way to look at an organization's culture. And this is the iceberg model. Uh, there's the surface level of the iceberg, and I'm sure if you've all watched Titanic or <laughs> read about icebergs, you know that most of the iceberg is actually below the surface, much like the ice cube when you drop it in your drink, very little of it is actually at the top of the drink. Most of it is underneath the surface of the liquid. And the surface level of a culture is the artifacts of the organization. That is what someone walking into your organization can see. So it's your signage. It's the clothes that people are wearing, whether you have a uniform or not, whether people are dressed, you know, top end professionally or not with suits and ties or power, you know, or, or elaborate, you know, dresses and such, or are they just casual, you know, t-shirts and sweatpants and shorts. That's a whole different thing. But those surface levels, it can be the posters on the wall. It can be the way the architecture is designed. Those are, those are the surface level items. Underneath the surface though, is the strategies and goals. These are the things that define how the corporation or the organization or the library is running. And even further than that, at the very bottom are the underlying assumptions that people have about the organization. You know, why it exists, how people are supposed to operate in it, how they're supposed to work with each other, how they're supposed to interact with the public. The thing is that a lot of times when people come into an organization, their first attempt at changing a culture is they change the artifacts, the stuff at the top. And while that's an easy thing to do, it's the low hanging fruit, it's the least impactful. Because you can, I'm sure you may have been in an organization where you have a new manager that comes in, he puts up new signs, tells people to wear a new t-shirt or whatever. But then once that manager leaves, the signs disappear and everyone goes back to wearing the old clothing. <laughs> it's very easy to change. The strategy and goals are a little harder to change, but you can change them. What's the hardest thing of all to change are the underlying assumptions that people have brought to the organization. Because if people come into an organization, I'm sure you've all walked into an organization somewhere where people just don't care that you even walked in. They don't seem to care that they're there. They're just looking for their next break, their next lunch, and for five o'clock when they can get out of there. And that's where you get to the underlying assumptions. So how do you change those? Because if you have hostile underlying assumptions where people are fighting each other, you know, maybe not physically, hopefully, but just verbally and passive aggressively in conflict with each other, it's gonna be a challenging organization to change culture-wise. So there's a few rules that if you wanna change the culture, first you have to adapt, understand. One of them is to identify if your culture is a BCD culture. Is, is it a culture that blames, complains, and defends? What that means is people in the culture never take responsibility for what they do. They like to blame other people. Or they like to complain, especially about management or in many cases, the public that they serve. They say, ah, you know, we just serve a bunch of idiots. And they often defend their own thing. You know, hey, hey, it's not my fault, it's not my fault. If you have a culture that engages in the vicious cycle of BCD, then it's gonna be hard for it to elevate up and for people to enjoy themselves. That's a culture where a lot of people are heading for the exits as soon as they get a better offer somewhere else. Now, one of the things that does drive this kind of BCD culture in some places is something called the fundamental attribution error. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this, but this is a classic um, psychological concept. It's essentially this. Um, if I, as an individual, make a mistake, 
it's probably due to circumstances I'm in. It's due to bad luck. It's due to other people, not me. But if someone else makes a mistake, it's easy to attribute to their character, right? Oh, they're a bad person. They're lazy. They're selfish. They don't care. And if you don't think this applies to you, let me ask you this question. Did anyone drive to work today? Uh, you know, we drive, we've got a lot of people driving in here in Florida. And I don't know if it's just you, but I've found other drivers in Florida are terrible. They're just the worst. I'm a great driver. You know, I'm perfect. I obey the rules. But everyone else, especially on the interstate, is horrible. Now, does anyone relate to that? I don't know if in Wisconsin you have bad drivers. Just Let me ask you, do you have bad drivers in Wisconsin? I've never been there. Um, well, so there's this thing in Wisconsin where we have a nickname for Illinois drivers, and I'm not going to say what that is. Okay. And, uh, right. I, and some people are <laughs> agreeing with me in the chat area. <laughs> okay. Well, and, I, I mean that jokingly. <laughs> Well, uh, obviously, if it weren't for those Illinois drivers, because everyone right. from Wisconsin is a good driver, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, but that's the fundamental attribution error in play, is that we tend to blame others for their character, and we credit ourselves with mistakes to bad luck or circumstances and such. And that's a very hard way, because it, our minds are actually kind of wired for this. So if we don't take time to really consider why other people are doing what they're doing, and we just slap a label on them, then we're gonna be trapped in making bad dis assumptions about people. Uh, another thing that drives bad culture, or a hard, it's hard for people to change, is something called the curse of knowledge. Did you all know that knowledge is a curse? Uh, and what I mean is this, yes, um, part of your mind, as soon as you learn something, begins to assume that everyone else knows it. And, and I like using this example. For those of you who work in a public library here, have you ever had someone walk in the door and say, wow, I never knew there was a library here? Uh, I, I don't know if you've had that situation, but I, you know, we're always surprised. Like, where are you new? Where have you been living all these years? And, you know, especially for people who may have lived in that community for 10, 15 years, it's their first time coming to the library. And that's because we know the library's there because we're there every day. So we naturally assume everyone in the community knows about the library. But if we make that assumption, we're actually missing a lot of our community who may not encounter the library. And it's not because they're uneducated people who don't care about books and such. It's just their travels don't take us there. In fact, it could be something as simple as their commute just never takes them down the road that your library is on. And if they just happen to change their commute one day, they would discover your library, something as simple as that. So I like to work under the assumption that most people are good and that people really want to do a good job. The challenge is that systems tend to break people down. If the system that's set up in your library, the policies, the procedures, the practices are not aligned to drive people in the right direction, then things are going to go wrong. In fact, there's, a, there's a, um, another behavioral um, psychology term called nudge. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term nudge, but essentially it's the idea that if you make a small change in a system, you get dramatically different results from the people working through that system. And the classic example that's done in studies is the idea of getting people to sign up for retirement accounts. And they've proven this in studies. If you look up nudge and retirement accounts in Google, you'll find these studies where essentially all an organization did, um, they're originally, they're system, you had to, the employee had to sign up for the IRA, or I'm sorry, for the, um, for the 401k. They had to, the employee was responsible for signing up, and they only had a sign-up rate you know, below 20%. But when the, when the organization switched it, and they made it so that they automatically signed everyone up, and employees would have to take the effort to opt out, they suddenly got over 80% participation in the 401k plan. Uh, just that one little change made a difference. So sometimes your culture could be just needing one little change. And there's been a lot of people looking at it. And the one book that I really have been excited about in the last few years, and we've been using in my library system as a way to map out a, a, a program to improve our culture, is a book called Prime to Perform. It's by Doshi and McGregor. And they are consultants who look at culture across a wide diversity of American society. And they came up with six key factors that affect motivation. Three of them are positive, three of them are negative. I'll share the negative ones first. Uh, they said inertia. Basically, people believe there's no good reason why they continue to work at their job. And if you have an organization where a lot of people 
think that way, you're gonna have an organization that's set to die because no one cares anymore. The next negative motivating factor is economic pressure. If people feel stressed out financially, then they're less likely to be able to give energy to their organization to give it their all. And this could be reflective of a low paycheck or um, limited benefits. Even if people have good paychecks and benefits, if they have other financial stressors in their life, it's gonna be hard for them to focus on their job. The third negative um, factor is emotional pressure. Uh, people feel compelled to work at their job and put on a happy face, even if they're sad inside. And this is where you might have psychological tension in an organization. If you have bullying, if you have high pressure to meet deadlines, if you have people who just aren't cooperating, passive aggressive organizations, for example, that can generate a lot of emotional pressure. Now the consultants also identified three positive factors that improve uh, society's motivation or culture, uh, culture of a motivation, ah, your organization's culture, sorry. Uh, one is that I continue to work on my current job because the work helps me reach my personal goals. People feel like they're growing and developing as an individual within the organization. That makes them happier to be there. Next is if they believe that their organization is achieving an important purpose, right? Um, and if that purpose aligns with the individual's purpose, then man, they'll do a lot of great work in that organization. Now, believe it or not, the strongest factor for, for an organization to be highly motivated and to have a strong culture is a sense of play. That is, I work at my job because it's fun to do. Uh, how many of you work in an organization where play is allowed, where you're actually allowed to have fun at work? <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes it seems like, uh, it's funny when I've asked even my employees this question, they go, play? fun. I'm at work. It's serious. Well, yes, there are times when you need to be serious. But the thing is that, are, do you have flexibility? There's a few ways to look at play. One is, do you have flexibility to experiment? Do you have flexibility to try new things? If something fails, do you just take it as a learning experience and are you able to move on? You know, are you able to come up with neat ideas? Do people get along? Do you have a good social environment where maybe you recognize birthdays and anniversaries and you have parties for the holidays where people actually can let down their hair a bit and, and share themselves? So play is a very dynamic piece of any organization. Now, if you read the book, you'll see there's a way you can take these six factors and survey your organization. So when we did this a couple of years ago, we got a score of 35.8 from a scale of minus 100 to positive 100. Now that placed us actually pretty good. And this is a little chart from their book. And you'll see that teachers actually scored pretty high in terms of motivation. And some of you might be surprised considering the last few years, there's been a lot of teacher um, protests where teachers have been out there campaigning for more funding and higher salaries and things like that. But if you think of a teacher, a lot of people go into the teaching profession because they're connected to the purpose. They wanna educate children. And if a teacher has a lot of flexibility in how they design their work plans, they can do a lot and have a lot of fun with the kids they're working with. And teachers often have a lot of professional development they need to do, so there's opportunities for them to grow. Contrast that with the bottom, people working in fast food, right? It's pretty drudge work, it's low pay, there's not a lot of interest in it, and you tend to get people complaining more than they thank people for their for their service, and it's a very it's a job where your um, you know your your job security is very low with very limited room to grow. So if you take all these factors together, you can kind of sort of you can take a assessment of your culture, and it's important to do that from time to time to see where your culture stands. So well, after you take the test in your organization, you say, well, this is great, but how do I put this into practice? And one John, of the recommendations, yes. Could you repeat what um, book you are referring to as far as this test? Oh, sorry, yes, let me go back. The book is called, I'll even jump back quick, do, 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 do. Prime to Perform, How to Build the Highest Performing Cultures Through the Science of Total Motivation, Nell Doshi and Lindsay McGregor. And it's a New York Times bestseller, so it should be in all of your public libraries <laughs> um, and, of course, available for, on, uh, through your favorite bookseller, whoever that may be. So. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'll jump ahead. Yes, and please stop me again if I'm going too fast or there's a question. So how do you put theory into practice? So uh, in Prime to Perform, they recommend that uh, you set up a group called Fire Watchers. 
Now, almost every organization, there's a group of people who watch the strategy, right? And they make sure that the organization's reaching its strategic goals. But what you need is a group of people who are looking to see how the culture is doing, continually taking the temperature, right? Making sure that the organization is thriving. So we put together our group, and here's a little photo of our group from about a year ago. And their first task when we pulled them together is to say, hey, let's examine our current culture. What are we doing well? And what are we doing poorly? And where can we improve? So they took a lot of time to survey the people in their own work groups and then have some uh, joint sessions where people came through for town hall type meetings. And what we gathered was a set of strengths and weaknesses. So for example, in my organization, people thought we delivered great customer service as a strength. But a weakness that they found was communication. They felt they needed information more timely, more completely. So we've been looking at different strategies on how to do that. But one of the core things we wanted to develop was called a culture playbook. And we just released our um, core ideas for that culture playbook. And we grouped them under three categories, loosely based upon the uh, three positive factors of play, purpose, and potential from the Prime to Perform book. We map them out a little differently. We have be curious, be helpful, and be resourceful. And what we're doing right now is we are releasing an email every week to expand on each one of the points under there. So for example, we've gotten two out already under the be curious factor of I enjoy the rewards of everyday challenges and I embrace the freedom of new ideas. And the idea is that as we move through this, we're gonna be fleshing out a larger playbook so that when we look at any culture issue, we, and as we coach our staff, we're saying, look, these are the things that we believe will help us move to a positive atmosphere where people will be working at their best, where they'll work together in stronger teams, where they'll be more excited about their job every day. And it's a process. It takes a while. We're actually doing this leading up to our staff training day that we're calling LEAD, where we're going to close all of our locations for a day, have everyone meet at a local theater, um, one of our performing theaters, and have a full day where we're going to dive into this material and other materials so that we can get everyone really excited and really on the same page regarding how we believe our culture will thrive the best. Now, one other thing I'm very excited about, and this is a new material that I just came across in uh, December, and I was referred to this report. It's the O.C. Tanner Global Culture Report. I was referred to it by a man named Pete Brumberg, who's the director for the Salt Lake City Public Library. And uh, there's a lot of pieces in here that are very exciting to me, and I'm going to be using these uh, with my leaders in my organization along to incorporate into the growing culture playbook. And I'm going to share with you some of the highlights I have here. So this is fresh new material that I'm giving you today. And the first thing that I took away from this was they actually had down what they thought was the secret of employee satisfaction. And in a lot of cases, we tend to think um, from the employer level, we tend to think that people are mostly satisfied by their paycheck or by their work hours or their benefits. Um, but actually, what drives employee satisfaction is something they term to as micro experiences. That is, the little things that happen every day on the job determine whether or not they're enjoying themselves and whether they're having a good time and whether they feel the organization supports them and whether they are going to contribute to the culture rather than tear it down. Now, micro experiences are small things, but they tend to come in two forms. You have the peaks, that is those times when you have a really good experience on a particular day. You know, you got a great compliment from someone in the public, you finished a great project, you just did a great presentation, everyone loved it. All these kind of things are peak experiences. But we also encounter valleys, those days where things don't go well. You know, a member of the public yells at you, the project you're working on collapses, the, um, you know, you had a snowstorm and it was hard to get into work, you know, it was just a bad experience. Uh, and that's really seems to be what they've determined is guides people's relationship with their organization. Are they getting enough peak experiences at work, positive experiences, or is it being more valley type experiences? And one little conclusion that I found that was very interesting was that they said that peak experiences last twice as long as valley experiences. So even though we tend to think, oh, if someone has a bad experience, it's going to last, 
it's actually, they don't last quite as long. Our, our minds tend to be forgiving about bad experiences and we tend to really look back fondly on those peak experiences. And you can try this for yourself. I mean, if you were to look back over the last year, you know, we just finished 2019, what are the most memorable pieces from this past year? And what will probably jump out at you are things like, you know, the work projects that really went well, the um, great experiences you might have had, maybe a, a wonderful vacation you took. You know, those, those are things that really can highlight your year. Now, it's important to map this out because um, one of their studies show that 79% of employees are suffering from lo some level of burnout. Now, burnout is basically that inertia, that emotional pressure that was referred to um, from Prime to Perform. This is where people really feel stressed out. And now, the fact that 79% of employees are suffering from some level of this is a, a very strong finding. And But the authors of the study say, look, it's something that can be mitigated and approached if you do things the right way. And one of their recommendations really was at the leadership. When you look at great leaders from all across the spectrum, whether it's in government, private business, nonprofits, et cetera, what they tend to do are these three things. They connect their employees to the purpose. And you might recall purpose was one of the strong motivating factors, right? They, they basically get people excited about what they're doing. They feel a sense of, a, and they also celebrate the accomplishments. When something goes well, they take a moment to thank people. They might have some little celebration, you know, cupcakes in the break room to celebrate or a bigger party, uh, depending on the situation. But another factor that's interesting is great leaders connect employees to each other. They don't just work uh, like a spoke and wheel system where it's the leader just connecting to a single employee and back again. They make sure those employees all connect to each other, not just in their work group, but across the organization. Because if people know each other across the organization, they tend to have stronger bonds, you know, especially important when they're not necessarily dealing with those people day to day. And I know from my experience coming through my organization, I've had lots of opportunities well before I was the director to interact with people in projects from across the organization. And I really felt that, personally, that made me feel a stronger connection to my library system. Now, we do know that a number of employees are not happy. And one of the reasons is this. They said that 54% of employees say their leaders don't know what they do. And that's really astonishing when you think about it. And this is actually even true of their immediate supervisor. There's a lot of employees who believe their immediate supervisor doesn't know what they do or doesn't understand the tasks that they do. And, and this can be very demoralizing. But in an example of how this can change very quickly, when leaders take the time to know what their employees are doing, the employees actually get happier very quickly. There's an increase in perception of the experience, an increase in the amount of great work the employees do when the leaders are more transparent with their team, when they take time to communicate, when they take time to understand. In fact, um, one of the things I did this past year was I went to every one of our 17 locations uh, uh, and to our support facilities, and I spent a half a day at each of those locations, just on the front lines, at each service desk, getting to know the employees, seeing the public as they come in, understanding the local challenges. And from my feedback I got, it was very well received that people thought as I, as a library director, would take the time to come out and spend a half a day with them. And I think it really made an impact. So the thing is that for team, um, for leaders too, and while they do have to connect everyone, that one-on-one -on -one experience they have with the people under them is really important because that's the time that the employee and the, and the leader, whether it's a supervisor or manager, can really dive into what's going on in the organization. And for one-on-ones, unfortunately, a lot of times when employees get one-on-ones, it's often to correct them about something. You know, they're pulling them into the office to say, no, you did something wrong, which means that a lot of employees kind of fear the one-on-one. But one-on-ones can be very successful. And the report highlights four ways to make it successful. First is you need to have a mechanism for constructive feedback, not just leader to employee, but employee back to the leader. You have to have time to brainstorm together to really talk about the job. And that's why it's important for the leader to understand what their employee does. Because then you can sit down there and help them work through ideas and strategies to make their work better. 
they have to offer opportunities for development. How can we help the employee grow and learn and build new skills? Because most employees don't want to stay where they are for their entire career. They want to promote up. They want to try new opportunities. And finally, that one-on-one -on -one is a great time for recognition, just to say, hey, you've done a great job. I've seen it. I love it. Thank you for doing it. Those things are impactful beyond belief. Now, the biggest takeaway I had as a leader of a large library system, and for those of you who may be leaders of your library system, was this. Um, quite often, leaders of CEOs or leaders of an organization take a lot of time outside of their organization. They see it as a role to connect their organization to the community. And, and this is very important. It's, it's something that I've identified as a big role in the chief diplomat. But actually, if you want to improve culture, they said, for top leaders, extra time spent with employees improved company performance while work spent outside with people outside the organization did not. So basically, if you're a leader and you believe that you want to improve your organization's culture, the most impactful thing you can do is actually spend time with your people. Stop being out of the office so much and spend time in, not only with the people in your office, immediate office space, but on the floor in the support areas, in your branches or remote offices as much as you can. And for me, this is actually a resolution I have for this year, is to get out more and spend a lot more face-to-face -face time with the people. And it's a little challenging for me because I have over 400 people working for my library system. So uh, to get out and to see them all, all our different locations is a challenge, but it's one I'm willing to take. Uh, the, one of the final pieces in the report was talking about how to make teams work successful in any organization. And what they said was, disappointingly, only 26% of employees feel their team works seamlessly together. So there seems to be a lot of opportunity to grow. And what they said was, what leaders need to do to have successful teams is to step back and provide these two things, a sense of autonomy and a sense of psychological safety. Autonomy means that the leader isn't directing all the work. They're saying, here are the goals. I'm gonna let you guys come up with the best approach to do it. And psychological safety means that the leader sets up a situation where employees feel free to share their thoughts, share their opinions, share their ideas, without being overly criticized, without being attacked, bullied, et cetera, where people feel safe together. And the leader has to set those ground rules and support them. Um, because what the leaders really want from their, what the teams really want from their leaders, sorry, is that support during challenging and stressful situations. It's a leader's role to come in and help move people in the right direction and to clear out obstacles and provide the resources they need for their teams to go. Uh, I like this quote here. Leaders need to move away from merely gathering feedback and instead listen authentically and act on what they've learned. And for leaders to communicate successfully, they need to do it through various means, uh, such as brainstorming sessions, team meetings, town hall meetings, and those one-on-ones. They also said if leaders hear about an issue, they need to do a quick follow-up. If something's come to their attention, you need to resolve it within three months, ideally or sooner if possible. So I'm going to give you a few parting, uh, parting uh, thoughts here, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. I'm sure you have a few. First of all, I'll just a word of warning. Once you start digging into your organization's culture, uh, a lot of people go into this thinking, oh, we'll make a great culture. We'll just dig in, we'll resolve it. But just be aware, you're going to start turning up some bones, <laughs> some, some things that were buried that people have shed away. And the reason they buried with them is because they're painful or challenging. And once you start digging them up, you may actually start to see a lot more frustration. It may actually feel like things are getting worse as soon as you try and improve the culture. And you might be tempted to say, oh, well, that was a waste of time and shut the door. But if you really want to have that positive culture, you have to understand that any change takes time. Turning, um, one way to think about it is, you know, it takes a battleship or a cruise liner many, many miles to make a turn. So you have to think the same way with your organization. The culture of an organization takes time. Remember that iceberg, it was buried at the bottom of those underlying beliefs? It takes a long time to get there. And for me, I know, I can't turn around and say every single thing I've done here for culture has been successful in my organization. We're still a work in progress and culture is always a work in progress. But if your goal is happy teammates, happy employees, people excited to come to work and accomplish things, then it is definitely well worth the ongoing time and effort and energy to do it right. 
So I'll just share quickly that if you're interested in anything I said today, I actually put some of these thoughts up on my blog recently at efficientlibrarian.com. Uh, from there, if you go there, you'll also find information on productivity and efficiency, which I think is important for everyone to be happy at work. Um, but that's my resource. You'll find uh, some of my articles on culture at efficientlibrarian.com. But otherwise, I want to thank you all for your time and attention. There's my contact information if you'd like to reach out to me. And I think we've got about 10 minutes left for questions from the floor. So Jamie, please let me know if anyone has any questions. Yes, I see several of them that have come in, so we'll get right to it. Um, <clears throat> the first one, what are some steps you can take when employees have very different personalities and have a difficult time working together because of it? Hmm. Well, if you look at the model, it's a very good question. If you look at the model that was presented today, part of it is finding out, okay, what are the common, what are things people have in common? And if they've all come to work for your company or your organization, then they must have at least some small connection to the purpose to even have wanted to be there. So that may be the starting point is, look, you know, why did you want to work here? What is it you believe, how do you connect to this culture? And part of that might be working independently with each employee first and getting to know them. And especially if you're the leader, if you've spent time with those one-on-ones and you get to know people, you'll be able to find the points of commonality. I mean, sometimes it could be something silly. Maybe you discover through your one-on-one -on -one meetings, everyone's watching the same show on TV or everyone's a big Green Bay Packers fan or something like that. You might be able to take that piece and say, okay, well, let's let's use that. Let's find something that everyone agrees on. Uh, so it's it's part of a challenge. You know, it can definitely be challenging when you have people of different backgrounds and different beliefs. But if you find can connect them all to the same purpose and do it in a fun way, especially through one-on-one -on -one meetings, I think that will be a good start to build up a team. Great. Uh, the next one, where is the difference between knowing what they do and knowing how they do it? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. And I think they're linked together. Uh, on a basic level, every supervisor should know what their employee is doing and how that contributes to their organization's success, to their strategy. Because if, an, if a supervisor doesn't know that, then how are they going to possibly supervise that person effectively? Now, the how they're doing it, I think, is where you start getting into the personal autonomy of that individual or that team. If things are functioning effectively, then it might be, well, you know, so long as you're doing it and you got the resources and you're staying within the guidelines, then go for it. I'm not going to get to that level of detail because very few people enjoy being micromanaged. But um, you know, my other hat is talking about workplace productivity and efficiency. So there may be times, especially during those one-on-one -on -one or team meetings, where you want the group or individual to sit back and say, okay, this is what you're doing. Let me Show me what you're doing step by step, and let's see if there's a way we can improve any bottlenecks or problems that they're encountering. Because as part of the learning process for the employee, I think it is helpful to sit down and have them show you everything that they do, especially if you're not familiar with it. But you want to be careful about trying to micromanage them too much on that task level. If you step back and give them the autonomy to work it, and it's successfully working within the parameters that make everyone happy, then you can sit back, relax, and just stay in touch with them and see if they have any problems or issues. They'll feel more comfortable bringing them up to you. Great. Thank you. The next question, do you have any advice on how to start in a new leadership position for an organization you know has some deeply buried skeletons? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. I mean, I, I didn't have to come to it myself because I worked my way up to the organization, but even so, uh, I still discovered a few things along the way. But I think the opportunity that such a situation has is when you're coming in new to an organization, you don't have the burden of the baggage that the prior leadership had. So a lot of employees may look and see you as an opportunity for change right off the bat. And if there's certain low hanging fruit in the organization that you can go ahead and change, such as a practice that for some reason your the prior leadership was wedded to, you might just be able to go there and make a few quick changes to get people's attention. And I think that's important. A few key small wins right off the bat can really get people starting to come on your side. But overall, I, I would, again, look at the strategies here. Uh, when you're new to an organization, you want to take time to listen. 
fact, um, in the OC Tanner report, they have a whole chapter devoted to listening. And that's a real key is just go around. I think in the first three months, unless there's some low hanging fruit that everyone agrees upon, the best thing a new leader can do is just take time to learn the organization, to learn about their people, to listen effectively, to give feedback, uh, to ensure that they're hearing that what they think they're hearing is correct and to take that time to build trust. Because in order to make any change, people have to trust you. They have to be willing to follow you. Sure, you can hold people to a gunpoint, for example, and make them follow you, but they're going to desert as soon as you put that gun down. You know? uh, so if you want people to move forward, it's because they trust you. Um, they, they feel that they can work with you and that you have their best interests at heart. So uh, it may take time. It will take time, certainly, because uh, you know, unless you have a mass exodus of people and you're able to hire new ones, if you're continuing to work with people from the prior who've been there before you got there, it's going to take time to earn their trust. So just keep working at it and try not to be too disheartened hearted if, if things seem to sometimes take a step backward. Great. We have about three questions left in about four minutes. So let's see if we can get to, okay. to all three. Um, how can you protect your department branch team that have a good culture from a larger culture that's not so great with the, that's not so great in the system? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. I mean, I, I see that sometimes with my library system. We're part of the county. So sometimes the county does something that affects my employees. And it is a challenging, tricky thing. But I think the, the first and most important thing is to make sure your team understands that you have their interests at heart and that even when there's going to be times that the rest of the organization is going to do things that impact your group, if leader, if your employees can look at you as a leader or supervisor, as someone who can mitigate, um, then, you know, and help to soothe these issues, that, that's certainly one way forward. Uh, it may not always be possible, but even if they know, as long as they know their leader is sympathetic to them, I think that can help a lot. Great. Thank you. Um, do you need your staff to recognize there is a need to improve culture before you start addressing it? Uh, that's a good question. And I believe that if everyone thinks there's a problem with the culture, that's important to, for things to move forward. Um, because if as a leader, you've identified aspects of a culture that you think are detrimental, then though it's up to the leader to open the discussion. And for a lot of people, they may just be happy doing what they're doing and they don't want to, you know, dig up the, uh, the things that have been buried. And it's really up to the leader to decide how far, how fast. And certainly if you don't have, if you've got a reluctant group, then you might need to extend the time frame. you know, take things in very small steps forward. Great. And our last question is, um, Doug, what are your thoughts about work flexibility as a way to motivate great employees. Have you seen a lot of research um, about this? Uh, yeah, I think it's very true that, um, and it falls under that sort of personal autonomy. If people feel they have control over how they do their work, it definitely makes them happier. Uh, you know, a lot of, sort of, certainly a big trend these days is remote working. Um, flexible things like that, whether it's one or two days a week or even the entire week working from home or remotely instead of having to come into an office. And there's certainly studies that show a lot of people like that. But there's actually um, one of the surprising things I found is there's a balance. There's some companies that have said, yeah, you can spend all your time at home if you want working remotely. But they find a lot of employees do want to come into the office a few days a week because they feel that social connection. They want to see people face to face. So uh, I guess really, when we talked about play as the most strongest factor that affects an organization's culture, flexibility is definitely part of that. If people have the knowledge and the freedom to be able to do their work in the way that they feel is best, you know, under the guidance of their supervisor or manager, then that's a way to definitely get people more engaged and be happier overall. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Doug, for an awesome presentation. A great way to open this conference. And thank you to all of you for your comments and your questions and participation. So as mentioned, this session recording and slides will be posted to our conference website later this week. We have two tracks coming up at 1030. 
One is in adult services and one is in technology. And again, those start at 1030. If you haven't registered for, for those two sessions or any of them going on today or tomorrow, you still can just go to the website and hit register. So we hope to see you for some more sessions today. And if not, have a great rest of your day. So long.